I'm Ken Harbaugh, host of Warriors in Their Own Words. If you love listening to this show as much as I love hosting it, I think you'll really like the Medal of Honor podcast produced in partnership with the Medal of Honor Museum. Each episode talks about a genuine American hero and the actions that led to their receiving our nation's highest award for valor. They're just a few minutes each, so if you're looking for a show to fill time between these Warriors episodes, I think you'll love the Medal of Honor podcast. Search for the Medal of Honor podcast wherever you get your shows. Thanks. I'm Ken Harbaugh, host of Warriors in Their Own Words. In partnership with The Honor Project, we've brought this podcast back at a time when our nation needs these stories more than ever. Warriors in Their Own Words is our attempt to present an unvarnished, unsanitized truth of what we have asked of those who defend this nation. Thank you for listening, and by doing so, honoring those who have served. Today, we'll hear from Lieutenant Colonel R.K. Montgomery. Montgomery served as a commando in the British military in World War II and led the demolition teams on Operation Chariot, also known as the St. Nazaire Raid. Charles Newman and um, Bob Ryder met at a conference in combined operations. He told his second in command that he'd got to have 120 chaps, I think, uh, trained to perfection in street fighting. Meanwhile, Pritchard and I were training the dock demolition people. Started up at um, Resyth, up in Scotland, general dock demolition training, which he did. And then we came to the, the sort of crunch and half the party came to me at Southampton and the other half went to him at Cardiff. And after a week's training, we turned around. And so the chaps who were at Cardiff came to Southampton and the chaps who were at Southampton went down to Cardiff. And from then on, those were the teams who were going to do the jobs that they were training on. Up till then, everybody had been trained to do everything. So if anybody was killed, another chap could take his place. And they were, <laughs> it was quite funny, actually, because the chaps were beginning to get a bit bored with this because we were going on and on at them. And at night, um, you know, we'd go down uh, as soon as it got dark and uh, practice at night and blindfolded and at night. And, um, and they, as I say, were getting browned off. And one of them wrote to uh, Robert Henriquez at Combined Operations Headquarters said, this chap, these chaps are quite good at teaching us, but by God, they do go on. <laughs> and uh, Henriquez was getting from Bill Pritchard, whom I was communicating with, the, the timing, you know, this number of seconds we'd managed to take off what we were going to do. Um, so that um, it was, there was a sort of, you know, one side didn't really know what was happening. Um, and at the same time, the MLs and uh, the naval craft were being allotted, not arriving. We then all, at the end of that fortnight, beginning of March, uh, we went, or well, halfway through March, we went down to Falmouth. And the commandos came down from Scotland in the... Um, Commando Depot ship, which was HMS, well, I don't know, it was HMS, but it was the Josephine Charlotte. It was one of the channel ferries in peacetime. And uh, then we, from Southampton, all went to Cardiff, uh, caught the train at Cardiff, which was a rather sort of a roundabout journey because we were going there and then coming back there. But then we all arrived down at Falmouth in the morning. And from then on, we continued training. And we went on something which the Navy euphemistically called seasick training. You don't really have to train anybody to be seasick. It comes naturally. <laughs> they took us down to the Silly Islands in these MLs and uh, were very successful. They trained almost everybody, including some of their own chaps, to be seasick. Uh, but one of the things about that was that it did teach you that however much you wished to die, as soon as you touched land, you were all right again, uh, which was a good, good lesson to learn uh, in case of the, the way over was, was rough. 
And then just after we came back from the silly hours, I think it was, we, well, the officers were all called into the wardroom um, and uh, there was a blackboard and a, a model with a sheet over it which was pulled off and Charles told us what we were going to do. And at that moment, there were two of us, Bill and myself, we knew exactly where we were going because by the impossible coincidence, that model was of the map which we had been given by transportation to work out all our sums on. Total coincidence. <laughs> and uh, so we, and we were sworn to secrecy by Charles uh, because we weren't told where we were going until about 24 hours before we left. There was one other person when the Navy were uh, briefed uh, who used to go up and down the, the Loire, and he recognised the, the model. Um, but um, and then we were we were at Falmouth. We were all the explosive arrived in a wagon. We um, took it all into a Nissan hut, and we then had to sit around. Luckily, the weather was decent, not like today. And um, we um, made up rucksack loads for each person. And this is why I say, you know. That charge, he wants to do that job, it goes into his, and so we sorted them all out. And um, that took about, in fact, actually it took the, just about a day to do. And it was a highly dangerous operation because we were putting explosive in, we were putting primers into the same rucksack, and we were putting detonators into the same rucksack as well. So once all that had been done, it was, the load was quite, um, quite dangerous. And um, by this time, or just at this time, the um, Princess Josephine Charlotte was cut off from the land, went out to the, into the roads and anchored in the roads, and there would be no more contact with the land except for, you know, under special licence. Uh, we hadn't been allowed to go out in the town anyway up till then. That evening, we thought we'd better go and see that the guard had had a meal and so Pritchard and I went ashore and um, we opened the Nissen hut door inside which the, all these rucksacks had been laid all the way around. And we opened the door and the, the soya stove in the middle of the Nissen hut was red hot. <laughs> and apparently I delivered myself of a few well-chosen words <laughs> about putting it out. And... Um, it wasn't until many years afterwards that I knew who the chap, who was the guard commander, because I didn't, I didn't know everybody, you know, well by then. And um, I told this story, and he said, it was I. <laughs> it was quite, it was a, a moment, that actually. That, uh, and... Um, I take it he didn't know <laughs> what was in the rucksack. Oh, well, he we knew what was in the rucksack. He didn't realize quite how difficult they were, how dangerous they were. I had, in my early training as a sapper, I had shared a room with a chap called Henry Braddle, who was a mining engineer on the Rant. And he, I remember, taught me more about demolitions than any of the instructors. And one thing that he said was detonators. Detonators, you want to keep as far away from detonators as you can. He said, I once saw an African crimp a bit of safety fuse into a detonator and he bit the wrong end of the detonator. And that was always rem remained with me. And it was a, whenever I was teaching people, it was a story I always told about the sort of, you know, you can get, um, well, you, you can get sort of the Arabic expressions are the best one, alakifik. <laughs> Just, you know, it's too easy. And as soon as people start getting like that, you've got to send them away um, because they're, they're, they're more of a danger to other people and themselves than they are to the enemy, I think. And then came the day... And uh, we were told where we were going. I had a, a bad moment then because I was called to um, Charles's cabin where he said, Bob, he said, um, we've just had some photographs in about the turpits and um, she is moving. And so if 
we finish our job and go back and you haven't finished yours, you've got to stay and complete it. But that dock demolition is absolutely vital. So I didn't tell anybody actually except my number two that. Uh, but it was a little bit of a shaker, as you can imagine. That evening, the evening before we set sail, Charles was called over to the Ditchmas Tyndale, which was where Ryder had his headquarters at this stage, and um, shown some photographs of the German um, torpedo boats that had moved down from Nantes and were actually sitting in saint Nazaire. And we just decided that that was bad luck, that um, they probably wouldn't have a great deal of effect except their, their chaps. But anyway, that was... Um, and then at the next morning, about midday, um, we got the signal. Uh, well, we got the by 9 o'clock, I think, prepared to chariot. And then we got 12 o'clock, we got carry out chariot and all the troops went onto their MLs. And the parties going on to HMS Campbelltown uh, were the last to do. And we must have left, I think, about 3 o'clock from Falmouth. And the, the strategy or the tactics of the, of the game uh, was to pretend that we were an anti-submarine sweep going down to Gibraltar. And uh, so that we moved in extended order down the, down the, the channel. The Camel Town was made to look um, as near as possible to a merva class um, German torpedo boat destroyer. It had its... One of its funnels removed, I think, or two of its funnels removed, and the other two cut down, cut so they were cut on a slant. Um, it had all its armament, uh, things like um, depth charges and so on, removed. But it had uh, bandstands on the, uh, the midships and to the stern, on which were Ehrlichans, uh were mounted, and it had a 12-pounder gun forward. Um, of the bridge. I have got, and Martha's got it, uh, a photograph of Campbelltown on her way to saint Nazaire, taken from Tyndale, uh, so that you can see oh, sort great. of um, what it looks like. The military party on or in Campbelltown uh, was commanded by, Char uh, by Bill Copeland, who was Charles' second in command. And... Um, it consisted of two assault parties, as I said, uh, under Roy and H Roderick, uh, who went one either side of the bars as we, when we'd hit. And uh, then two protection parties, which were small parties, only about five chaps altogether, officer and four, uh, one to go to the top end of the dock and the other for the bottom end of the dock. And then the demolition parties, which were... Um, one officer and four for the winding houses and the pump house, and one officer and six for the Kassoon gates. The next day, when um, we um, came across a submarine, a German submarine, which was um, had been damaged, we thought we'd sunk it, Tendo thought it was, but it hadn't. And um, the commander of the submarine, when he a few hours later, surfaced, uh, made a signal to say that we were an anti-submarine, that's what he reckoned, we were an anti-submarine um, sweep down through the Bear Biscuit, so that he actually helped our cover plan. We met him after the war. He came to one of our reunions, and uh, he, in fact, his submarine, sank the destroyer, which had attacked him about a year later, uh, but he said on that particular occasion, his submarine was damaged. His crew were very untrained, and he, so was he, and the only way he could trim his submarine was to have the crew running up and down inside it <laughs> after he'd been depth charged. Well, I, was, which I must say, <laughs> I wouldn't have liked. But um, anyway, that soon after that, we got into uh, a whole host of French shipping, um, fishermen, and we took the captain and crew off one and sunk it. He, he was delighted because he wanted to go to England anyway. Uh, it was quite a number did. Uh, to complete aside now, the director of research 
of the Echo Musée in saint Nazaire is a gentleman called Charles Nicholl. His father managed to get to England, went to Wales, where a lot of Bretons went, because the language, Welsh and Breton, is fairly similar. Married a Welsh girl, and uh, is now back in saint Nazaire. But there were quite a number of those chaps. Another chap who took me over to... Um, uh, do all the recce's for our 40th anniversary reunion there. Uh, his father came to England during the, the war. But anyway, they, they, that was the, the, the Finch fishing. And he, this fish, fishing captain, um, he said that there were no Germans, because the Germans were apt to put chaps with radios on board the, the fishing boats. Uh, and he said there were none in this particular lot. So we were rather relieved and proceeded on our way. And eventually, um, we came at eight o'clock at night. After dark, we came across the submarine. Uh, a submarine had been sent out to survey itself in and act as a beacon for us to give us our last navigation point before we entered the Loire. With the busy fall season already in swing, you might be looking for wholesome, convenient meals for jam-packed days. Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit, can help you fuel up fast with chef-prepared, dietitian approved ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. You'll save time, eat well, and stay on track with your healthy lifestyle. Level up with Gourmet Plus options, prepared to perfection by chefs and ready-to-eat in record time. Treat yourself to upscale meals with premium ingredients like broccolini, leeks, truffle butter, and asparagus. Looking for calorie-conscious options? Try delicious, dietitian approved calorie-smart meals with around or less than 550 calories per serving. Need an extra boost to support your wellness goals and feel your best as you tackle a busy autumn? Try Protein Plus meals with 30 grams of protein or more per serving. With Factor, you can rest assured you're making a sustainable choice. We offset 100% of our delivery emissions, source 100% renewable electricity for our production sites and offices, and feature sustainably sourced seafood in our meals. This September, get Factor and enjoy eating well without the hassle. Simply choose your meals and enjoy fresh, flavor-packed meals delivered to your door. Ready in just two minutes, no prep, no mess. Head to factormeals.com slash warriors50 and use code warriors50 to get 50% off. That's code warriors50 at factormeals.com slash warriors50 to get 50% off. I'm Allison Holland, host of the Kennedy Dynasty podcast. Equipped with a microphone and a long-term fascination of the Kennedy family, I am joined by an incredible cast of experts, friends, and guests to take you on a fun, relaxed, yet informative journey through history and pop culture. From book references to fashion to philanthropy to our modern expectations of the presidency itself, you'll see that there is so much more to Kennedy than just JFK or conspiracy theories. Join me for the Kennedy Dynasty podcast. As we went up the Loire, uh, we went up with the motor launches in two lines ahead, with the Campbelltown in the middle, the motor gunboat, which was the headquarters ship, in front, and uh, Mickey Wynn's motor torpedo boat with delay action torpedoes in it behind. Uh, one um, of the uh, the port or the starboard column was to land at the old mill, and they were um, the demolition teams were to um, carry out demolitions of the bridge at the far end of the harbour, the bridge between the dry dock and uh, the main dock, the lock gates between the Avant Port and the Bassin de saint nazaire and then the other line was to land and to uh, all their demolition chaps were going to blow up all the hydraulic station and all that sort of side in the old town. So those were the two. And what the idea of them, all those demolitions uh, were primarily to turn us into an island because if they blew the, the uh, gates, the, the bridges and the gates, the Germans couldn't get across onto the, the old town island. 
and to blow up the hydraulic gear which operated those gates and um, the bridges. The party on the Campbelltown uh, was to <coughs> had two assault parties, one which was to hold the area of the pump house and the Kassoon Gate winding gear, and the other one was to destroy the... Um, to clean out any Germans and destroy the um, fuel tanks, which were on the starboard side. As we came up the Loire, uh, Sam Beatty and I were up on the top bridge on the Camel Town. We saw the uh, masts and funnels of the Lancastria, which had been sunk in 1940, there, just after I'd left La Belle to go north. And um, we saw the air raids start and then fizzle out, uh, and, and they didn't seem to drop anything. And um, the searchlights, uh, and there were guns firing, and then everything sort of went quiet. And um, then as we got nearer, uh, we grounded. And we grounded a couple of times and got loose, all right, but it was a, a worrying moment when we felt a sort of slow and shudder. Um, and then when sort of signals started flying around, Sam said, I think we'd better go down. It's a little bit more protected on the, uh, the armoured bridge. And so he went down there, and um, I was merely on the bridge to act as a sort of uh, liaison between Sam Beatty, who was the captain, and Bill Copeland for when we started getting people off. And um, he came up, and I can't remember the sort of, you know, exactly what happened, but um, we were fired on, or the searchlights came on, we gave a signal, the searchlights went off, and the searchlights came on again. This is another signal which went fut, and then all hell got let loose, and there was stuff coming in every direction. And the thing that is, one still remembers, was the sort of, um, they were quadruple shots, from the Bofus guns, I think, sort of boom, 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 and the whistle, and there was coloured tracer. It was the most wonderful firework display you've ever seen, but um, we weren't really sort of interested in that. And the bridge got hit. The Campbelltown was being hit by fairly large bricks. According to, and you've read this, I expect, uh, to Lucas Phillips, one was it battery of guns fired something like over a thousand rounds of 75 millimeter that night? So there was quite a lot of stuff flying around. And um, the quartermaster got hit, um, who was um, on the wheel of Campbelltown. And I was immediately behind him, so I sort of went forward and took hold of the thing. And luckily, Tibbetts was behind me. He said, Get in, come on, I'll, I'll, I'll take it. Uh, because I, I having to think, you know, sort of what was port and what was salvage, <laughs> not being a sailor. And um, then Sam suddenly saw uh, the, he was making really for the um, Avant Port. And he suddenly saw the, the, the searchlight lit up the lighthouse on the end of the Edinburgh Mole, and he was able to change direction very rapidly to starboard and then back again. And by this time, it, the chaos ran. I think, well, Sam and I and Tibbetts, I think, were the only ones left alive on the bridge by this time. And we went through the torpedo net, and you could hear it. And then we hit, and it was a sort of crunch when we hit. And we went further in than we'd actually calculated by about four foot, so that the charge was absolutely up into the cassoon. But it did ride up over the top of the gate so that it was quite difficult to get off. And we had to use scaling ladders and uh, nets to, to get down. And sometime, uh, the... 12-pounder had been hit, and it must have been hit by an incendiary as well or something because there was a fire. There was a hole in the deck and there was a fire, and a number of people fell into the hole and had to be sort of pulled out. And there was one chap who was um, one of Corrin Purden's um, gang doing the, 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 the winding house at the top end of the, um, of the dock um, who took his trousers off because he... he got phosphorus or something on them, and he just couldn't put them out. 
So he carried out the entire operation in his underpants. <laughs> but um, uh, everyone got off remarkably quickly. And I thought, well, the, the place I'm going to go and make quite certain goes right is the, the pumping house. And we found the door was locked. And for some reason, we'd never sort of thought, I suppose because when we were at Southampton, you see, the door's been unlocked. But luckily I had some charges because we thought we might have problems of getting into one or two places, and so we, we were able to blow our way in. And um, as we were, we just lit the fuse on this thing, this charge to blow the magnet charge to blow the door in, our protection party officer came whizzing round the corner and shot into the, the sort of, the, you know, there was a, a baffle wall round the door. He shot in there, we had to pull him out just as the charge went off. And they went in, went down below. I went to see what, how the winding house was getting on. That was all right. So I thought, well, I'll try and get on board one of the ships that was in the uh, dry dock. But that was quite impossible because there was an enfilade going straight down across the, the gangplank. Um, and, um, so, and then I suddenly thought, well, what a bloody stupid I am, you know, because um, the, when Campbelltown goes up, they'll be wrecked anyway. <laughs> so we gave that one up. It was set to go up as soon as we'd left. It consisted of about three tons of explosive in depth charges in a concrete emplacement. And um, it was wired up to um, delay action fuses. The chap who was in charge of that uh, was Nigel Tibbetts, who was a torpedo lieutenant. Um, in Campbelltown, and he was the expert. He'd done all the calculations uh, for the, what the charge was to do, how far back uh, the ship would buckle so that it would be up against it, and he was remarkably accurate in his... Um, thing. Unfortunately, he was killed uh, later on. But um, he and Bill Pritchard and Abel Seaman Demoweek were, I think, the only people who knew where any of the fuses were. And um, he set the fuses off. Fuses were acid, eating through copper. And um, they were due to go up, I think, at about sort of four o'clock in the morning. Uh, and that was, of course, one of the problems, as they didn't go up until much later. We landed at, what was it, one one thirty. 1.34, I think, actually, because I remember Sam Beatty saying we're four minutes late. And it wasn't due to go up until after four o'clock, by which time we should have been halfway down Loire, because we were only going to take about three quarters of an hour, and we took less, in fact, um, to lay the charges and things. Um, we were later on, when we were in saint Nazaire, we were a bit worried um, that it might go up at any moment. Um, Chris Smalley came out of the winding house and said, ready to fire. So I said, okay, fire. There wasn't anybody about. Of course, Bob Ryder appeared just as they fired and a lot of the stuff came down on his head. But uh, it, the first attempt didn't, didn't go. What it was, I don't know. Possibly um, one of the igniters didn't work. So they had to go back in, which is not a nice job to do, um, and... Um, far again, and that time it was successful. At that stage, Stuart Chant and his party came out from the um, pump house, and he'd been, he was one man short, he had to leave one chap up above because he'd been wounded on the Campbelltown, and so he couldn't get down all the, the stairs because he was 40 foot down where the pumps were. And um, Stuart came out, having set off his charges with the four chaps, and they laid down onto the wall of the pump house, and I said, back. And they went back, leaving their rucksacks, and one of them had a chunk of concrete on the top of the rucksack, which would have done him in. Um, but the thing went up very satisfactorily, because the whole place heaved, and all the windows came out. It, there was, I think, about 300 pounds of explosive, 40 foot down. So the sort of tamping effect was, uh, was pretty terrific. And... Um, then we went in to deal with all the um, electrical gear, transformers and things like that. 
And um, one of the motors had gone straight through the floor. Two of them were leaning sort of sideways. It, there was no point in worrying about the motors. They, they were done. In fact, two had gone through the floor. I think one was just sort of halfway through. Um, so we concentrated on the transformers and setting the oil alight, and we could not set that oil alight. I just don't know why we had tar babies and incendiaries and could not get it to light. Well, we had one sergeant, his job was um, um, he had rubber gloves and a, we all had fireman's axes and a sledgehammer, and he went to town on the, um, the electrical dials and things, and it was, <laughs> that was quite funny, actually, because there were sparks flying in every direction. Um, but... That was very satisfactory, the whole thing. Uh, so was the winding house. So at that stage, I decided I'd better go up and see how they were getting on up the top. And I'd got about three quarters way up the, the dock when I met the first chaps coming back and they said that they hadn't been terribly satisfactory on the cassoon because they couldn't get inside the cassoon. It's shaped rather like that box, sort of rectangular, and it's, it's the gate, in fact. And you wind it in and out on rollers. And the winding house is the thing that winds it in and out. Uh, it's, what was it, about 40 foot wide and the length of the cassoon and about 40 foot deep. So it was, it was a big, I mean, it was almost the size of the, of Campbelltown. <laughs> it was a big bit of equipment. But they, when the, the chap who was responsible for that, the gate up at the top, the cassoon gate, he was badly wounded, and the chap who was going to be on the uh, seaward uh, gate, I told him to take his party up. He was killed, and uh, because they did come under fire from the Germans, almost sort of alongside, and um, but they managed to get a lot of their um, plum puddings over the side, and the sergeant who took over... Uh, he uh, didn't leave until he heard water going into the cassoon. So that it, had, it was off its base, off its rollers, and um, had been fairly badly damaged. But that was the only bit that was not 100%. The, uh, the winding house, uh, the whole thing just took off and sort of landed and fell to bits. Um, they continued firing at us. Um, I don't think there were any actually in... Our dock area, when we start, yes, there were. Because there were some on top of the, uh, the pumping house. But they, uh, as soon as we landed, they, they made off very rapidly. Uh, Johnny Roderick had quite a battle amongst the um, fuel tanks and wasn't actually able, we, we found setting that oil light was almost impossible. Um, and um, he had a, quite a battle on his hands, but they, they left. And it was only really towards the end of our time that they started getting reinforced from outside. The winding houses were completely okay, and the pumping house, as they say, the, the chaps on top of that ran. But, of course, we were under fire from the top of the submarine pens, which overlooked the um, from the other side. And they had could see right down on top of us. And... Uh, I'm heading back to Charles's headquarters. Uh, I found a truck in a building and blew them up on the way because I had some explosive left in my rucksack. I seemed to fit it or waste it. And uh, so then we had to get across the bridge across the old entrance. And, of course, that was being fired on from the uh, top of the submarine pens and they just firing straight across it. So we had to cross sort of hand over hand on the girders underneath the bridge and got across, reported to Charles Newman, and up to this moment, I thought that everything had gone absolutely according to plan. Well, it had, as far as we were concerned. Um, and I said to Charles, I mean, we've completed the job. Uh, do I have to go and embark, or can I go and have, see how Pritchard's getting on? And at that moment, Stan Day, who was the adjutant, said, um, embark, Bob, look out in the river. And I looked out in the river, and all these, the MLs were all burning furiously. I didn't see any sort of life anywhere near where we were going to be re-embarked from. And so and we gradually came in, all the, the chaps, and Charles, um, who hadn't turned a hair at all, he said, well, I'm afraid, chaps, that uh, 
The transport seems to have let us down and we're going to have to make our own way home. And uh, so we've decided that we'd fight our way through the town and then split up into parties on the other side of the town. And uh, we set off. And I happened to be sort of fairly up the front to begin with. Luckily, we went into a blind alley and turned around and I was then at the back, which was... Um, I'm a back row soldier, actually. <laughs> anyway, we, um, uh, we fought our way through the sort of warehouses and up alongside, and we were running along the side of the, the basin, and uh, somebody, I think it must have been in one of the boats moored in the basin, anyway, held a, a hand grenade, and it burst somewhere quite close to me, and I got a chunk of um, metal in my behind. And uh, it was just like shooting a rabbit or you know, small animal. I was going along full pelt and I did a complete somersault. And I thought to myself, I'm dead. And then I found I wasn't, so I got up and <laughs> went on and I wasn't very far behind the others. But we crossed the bridge and we got into the town and then they, by this time, they, you know, it was, it was only, I suppose, not more than an hour after we'd landed. They'd, um, the army had started coming in and they were using, um, armoured cars and motorcycle patrols, sidecar patrols on all the streets and shooting up the sidewalks and uh, so on. And so we'd, it was decided we'd go to ground. And we went into a cellar and um, patched up chaps who were wounded and someone cut the bit of metal out of my behind and uh, administered a field dressing. And then the Germans searched the house and they were just going out when somebody shouted, have you looked in the cellar? And uh, we had someone on the door of the cellar, and so as soon as that happened, we um, surrendered. Because um, I personally, if I'd been a German, I'd have just chucked a couple of grenades in and said, you know, share that amongst you. Um, but they didn't, and um, they pulled us out. They were very excited. But, um, and um, then we were in a... One of the, uh, the soldiers pulled a grenade out of his pocket and said, what do I do with this? <laughs> the Germans saw him and got very excited indeed. Uh, and I think they thought we were going to sort of attempt to escape or something. They lined us up against a wall and trained a machine gun on us. I must say, I thought I'd, that was the end. But it, um, some officer came up and, um, and sorted the thing out. And then we were um, taken away to our headquarters and it was not until about 10.30 in the morning that Campbelltown blew up. And we were all getting slightly twitchy about it because it ought to have gone up. And there are all sorts of stories, and there are myths. All these things. There's a myth that somebody went on board and um, uh, reactivated the fuses. Well, as I said earlier on, there were only three people who knew where those fuses were, and they are all dead. Uh, and buried in their grave. Well, no, one, and it was only died a few years, a few months ago. Uh, but the other two would, they have graves in San Jose, so they wouldn't have gone up with it. And so it's no good saying that they were, might have been somebody, might have said, oh, you know, might have been taken on board. But um, anybody who knew anything about where that, I knew where it was, but I didn't know the detail. But there were other things on our mind as well at the time. And uh, I don't know, we, I think as far as I was concerned, I knew enough about explosives not to be all that worried at that time. I got worried later on when it got on to about 8 o'clock and nothing had happened uh, because those acid fuses were notoriously unreliable. They went in the end, but not always when they were supposed to. And I think, with hindsight now, that probably the fact that that fire was burning, which the chaps fell into on the forecastle or inside, it was just on top of the explosive, that that possibly distilled off some of the acid. And the result was that, um, you know, there was, um, it took longer. Cheers and shouts. <laughs> <laughs> it was actually quite a loud noise, which was produced. Everybody knew it was going, it was needed. Then, of course, we didn't get the other ones, which were 
Mickey Wen's torpedoes, which were about 48 hours later, which completely upset the, the performance. Because they moved us out to La Bole to be interrogated. And we were taken to a place which I'd had a meal in in 1940. It completely destroyed, well, not completely, but it, it destroyed the cassoon, the inner cassoon, uh, the outer cassoon, rather, um, I think beyond repair. The inner cassoon, uh, they were able to repair, and there are some pictures of it. The whole of the front end, bows, of Campbelltown disintegrated. The gun was picked up, it was dredged up, and is now in um, uh, next to the memorial. And there was an inrush of water, of course, into the, the dock, and that damaged the two tankers that were in the dock. And as an incidental, there was, I don't know how many, I mean, the numbers vary from 100 to three, 400 people on board Campbelltown when she went up. Sam Beatty uh, was being interrogated when um, it blew up. And the German, just before it blew up, the German who was interrogating him, was quite a nice chap apparently, said, you know, you were a bit foolish. If you really thought that you were going to cut that cassoon in half with a, a small thing like that destroyer. And at that moment, up it went. And Sam said, you know, we're not quite as stupid as we look. <laughs> they were all a marvelous set of chaps, actually. But they, um, and still are. And we still have a very strong Senazer society, which is naval and, um, and army. The thing I didn't mention actually at all in the thing was the fact that there was supposed to be the air raid, but the air raid didn't, didn't appear, which was a pity, because it would have, might have made a lot of difference. We were supposed to have air support, really, just to keep the guns pointing up in the air instead of pointing at us, because uh, they were all, nearly all dual purpose air cat guns. And uh, the idea was that if there was a raid on, they'd be firing up into the air and uh, wouldn't see us. But in fact, they woke everybody up. And the German commander, um, whose name escapes me at the moment, he, when they milled around and didn't drop bombs, because and, and Winston Churchill, after the war, when he was um, <laughs> in the loo with Colonel Charles, who'd gone to dinner with him, <laughs> said, you know, um, you've only got me to thank for the fact that the air raid didn't work because I said that they were not to bomb unless they could see their targets because I didn't want civilians killed. And that was the trouble. You see, they were up on top above the cloud. And when it had been suggested at one of the um, briefings that uh, they should come down below the cloud if it was, um, you know, sort of fairly high, um, the Air Force officer said, well, we can't order them to do that. It would be absolute murder. Charles said, well, if it's going to be murder for them at 10,000 feet, what do you think it's going to be for us at sea level? <laughs> but, uh, uh, the Air Force at that time were not very tri-service minded. Bomber Harris wanted to bomb Germany, and he wanted all his bombers bombing Germany. He didn't want sideshows like San Nazaire to interfere. If you look at the, the chaps we had, the number of people who ended up as sort of managing directors of their own businesses and that sort of thing after the war. The ones who got through, they were, they were a, a cut above the, the average infantryman. Uh, there was no doubt about it. They learnt very quickly. And, I mean, you know, the discipline was incredible. <laughs> when they came down to Southampton, uh, we had two huts in uh, a TA... Um, drill hall barracks, which was occupied by a regular, or not a regular, by an ordinary soldier in the adjutant. Uh, when I went down sort of f to fix up their accommodation and feeding arrangements, I said, um, what, what, we we're a bit frightened of these chaps. <laughs> what happens if they misbehave? I said, they won't misbehave. Um, because if they misbehave, they go straight back to their unit. That was the sort of ultimate, really the only punishment. There was very, you know, no sort of confined to barracks or anything because we hadn't got any barracks. Um, and so it was either you were ticked off, told not to be a naughty boy, and if you did it again, well, out. 
the high priority was totally successful. And that was the thing which didn't sort of appear in the press, unfortunately, in England, because, of course, nobody who landed got back until later when some of the, uh, there were about four or five soldiers who managed to escape and get into Spain. But that was, they didn't get home until months later. Three years you were a POW. I mean, yeah, yeah. I was moved to, um, after we'd been up in the naval camp where they took us to begin with, uh, they moved all the army. Um, the, all the uh, soldiery went to Lambsdorff, I think. And um, the officers went to Spangenberg. Well, Spangenberg was a sort of second Colditz, in fact. It was a castle on top of a hill with a 40-foot wide, 40-foot deep dry moat all around it. We jolly nearly got out in a tunnel and someone gave it away. And that I got involved in because I was being a sapper. Um, I knew something about digging tunnels. We all spent most of our time trying to get out well, quite a lot of the time trying to get out, making maps, um, planning weird ways. Corrin Purden and Dickie Morgan, they got out but were picked. And no one got away from Spangenberg completely. Everybody was picked up in the end. Now, um, I'm a part of a very large family which unfortunately grows smaller every year. But it is, a, I had to give the speech at um, reunion two or three years ago. And I said, you know, I mean, you, know you have a nuclear explosion, uh, you have the fission, but the bigger explosion is the fusion. And the, what we did then uh, fused a family because we're all friends. The Sun of Society is quite something actually. That was Lieutenant Colonel R.K. Montgomery. Thanks for listening to Warriors in Their Own Words. If you have any feedback, please email the team at kharbaugh at evergreenpodcast.com. We're always looking to improve the show. For updates and more, follow us on Twitter at team underscore Harbaugh. And if you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to rate and review. Warriors in Their Own Words is a production of Evergreen Podcasts in partnership with The Honor Project. Our producer is Declan Roars. Bridget Coyne is our production director, and Sean Rule Hoffman is our audio engineer. Special thanks to Evergreen executive producers Joan Andrews, Michael DeAloya, and David Moss. I'm Ken Harbaugh, and this is Warriors in Their Own Words. I'm Allison Holland, host of the Kennedy Dynasty podcast. Equipped with a microphone and a long-term fascination of the Kennedy family, I am joined by an incredible cast of experts, friends, and guests to take you on a fun, relaxed, yet informative journey through history and pop culture. From book references to fashion to philanthropy to our modern expectations of the presidency itself, you'll see that there is so much more to Kennedy than just JFK or conspiracy theories. Join me for the Kennedy Dynasty podcast.